And we're live. Welcome to 60 Minutes of Unscripted.net Entertainment. As doctors of .net, we prescribe healthy choices in .net, and we might prescribe some unhealthy ones too. I'm your host, Cam Soper, with my co-host, Luis Quintanilla, and we would like to welcome our guest, Isaac Abraham. Isaac, please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, my name's Isaac. I'm the Director of Compositional IT. We're um, an F-sharp and Azure consultancy and using .NET for, um, since .NET 1.0, using C-sharp for years, uh, using F-sharp for uh, probably five or six years now, .NET MVP. Um, yeah, the usual, the usual things that come along with that. So yeah, .NET dev. So, so like your, your, your consultancy is like a pure like F-sharp consultancy? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we do .NET development. Um, you know, I kind of describe it as like three things. Like one, we're passionate about great software. Two, we think .NET is the best place to do that. And then F Sharp is the best place on .NET to, to write that software. Huh. That's, kind of, uh, that's, yeah, that's that really interesting. Um, well, uh, to fall in with our F Sharp theme this month, uh, we're glad we, we could have you on. Uh, Luis, how about a checkup document? Let's do it. All right, so uh, for this week, we have this document called uh, Tour of F Sharp. Now, uh, the Tour of F Sharp is exactly what it sounds like. It takes you through some basic uh, or, or introductory type of concept and get you started developing F Sharp applications. Um, if you're in .NET, a lot of the same ways that you would develop apps would apply. You still have the .NET CLI um, and, and you know all the mechanisms that .NET provides you with. Um, but you know, F Sharp being its being its own language, there's a few things that might look a little bit different. Um, perhaps if you're coming from, say, a, a JavaScript or a Python framework, the sort of the how things are delimited and spaced out and, and organized might look similar. Um, but yeah, so the tour of F Sharp kind of takes you through a few of those concepts. Uh, functions and modules are some of the first ones. The way that you sort of organize code uh, is in these modules, right? And that's how you lump together pieces of code that sort of, um, you know, are, are, are meant to work together or try to achieve some of the same goals. Um, and then within that, you have functions, which is are really first class entities within F Sharp. Uh, F Sharp is, uh, you know, it's, it's a functional first programming language, um, as, and we'll learn a little bit more about that with Isaac. Um, but functions are first class, meaning that you not only can they, um, can you use a function like you normally would, but also you can pass those in as values and, and perform a few other things. Uh, and compose functions, smaller functions into larger functions, right? So uh, that's kind of where, where we kick it off with uh, here. Um, one of the things that it also talks about is when you're binding values, right? Um, in F sharp, values are immutable by default. Um, now, you know, that may seem a little bit, you know, different than say, if you're working with something like C sharp, um, but actually it has a lot of really, really nice benefits, um, right, of working with immutable data, mainly the fact that it's it's easier to reason about when your data is not changing, when you're, you're applying transformations to your data, right? Uh, you can sort of reason about and, and have a predictable way of, of seeing what the outputs are, are of your data without actually making changes to the original data itself. So um, again, with, with, uh, with um, values, you kind of use this let, keyword here and that's how you assign values and values could be many things like functions uh you know integers any primitive types even types like uh records and, and all sorts of stuff uh however you know if you do want the option of of using mutable values you can just use the mutable keyword here and now you're able to assign and make changes to uh, the values themselves um this section here takes you through the different types primitive types like uh, numbers booleans and strings and how you can work with them um so this is pretty much the same uh, if you're used to seeing them. Uh, you so also have, I, yeah, go for it. I, I have a real quick question. So yes. is there is there any document that like for someone like me? So I'm I'm looking at you guys. Um, you're both F sharp experts. I don't know anything about F sharp. I mean, other than what I've heard you talk about over you know mm -hmm. the past couple of years, Luis. Um, but the. For someone like me who's sitting out on the sidelines and feeling maybe a little bit of uh, FOMO, right? Like y'all are, are are playing F sharp, and I don't. I I'll be honest, I don't get it. I, I look at this and I'm like, <laughs> you, you right. know, um, uh, is there somewhere? Is there like an F sharp for C sharp developers document somewhere that that's like okay, 
for object oriented people, this is where like functional is completely different from object oriented. And this is where it's similar. And is, is there anything like that? Just, I mean, I'm to put you on the spot. If uh, so, uh, a document itself, I'm sure that there are a few out there. And uh, this video was not sponsored <laughs> by Isaac. Um, but what I will say is um, Isaac's book, uh, I, I forget the, the title, is it Program with F Sharp or Get Started with F Sharp? Yeah, programming. Uh, yeah. Program with F Sharp. Uh, that's actually a really, really great resource, right? And throughout the book, uh, Isaac really makes those comparisons like, hey, here's how you would do something with C Sharp. By the way, here's the F Sharp way of doing it, right? Um, and Fields Novell actually. Uh, he points out that F Sharp for fun and profit, um, which is uh, kind of a blog post, sorry, not a blog post, uh, a blog um, and, and site dedicated to F Sharp um, is a really great resource as well that has a little bit more bite-sized uh, information. Um, so, so those two, I would say, you know, I found are a really great resource resources uh, for say a C Sharp developer looking to to learn, you know, A, how, how F Sharp compares to it and what's the F Sharp way of doing things. Okay. Sorry, I, I sorry to sidetrack off the the walkthrough of the check. No, no, I, that's that, I, yeah. I, I, but you were talking about you know the like the mutable yeah, immutable versus immutable values there, and I'm like, why why don't C sharp doesn't work like that? And um, so yeah, and that's it definitely why takes I a while. It, it definitely takes a while to sort of wrap your head around it. Um, you know, when you're first starting out, um, but eventually you start to just it, you know you get to that point where where it just starts making sense. You know, it, it's it's it, and, and, you know, you start to see the benefits of working with immutable values. Um, so, yeah, um, but, but it's one of those things that you kind of, you know, it, it takes a while to sort of wrap your head around how you would do things with immutable data. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see here, tuples. Uh, so F Sharp has tuples as well, and this is how you would go ahead and rep represent tuples. And, um, here's more or less how, um, actually in this case, it doesn't show how you could deconstruct them, um, but you could deconstruct them just like you would in, in C Sharp. So if you're familiar with tuples, um, you know, that they, they kind of work in a similar similar way here uh, in F Sharp. Um, and then this one, which I think is one of the coolest features, which is pipe lesson composition, um, right? Which is the fact that you can apply the input and you can have an, a value as input and using this um, sort of uh, pipe operator here, you can go ahead and apply a series of functions building out a pipeline of steps that are going to transform your data and, and operations that are going to transform your data. Um, so so yeah. let me let me interject again. Mm -hmm. So as someone who's pretty familiar with PowerShell, this reminds me of PowerShell. Would that be a would that be a appropriate comparison? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, yeah, exactly. And if you're using Bash, right, you're used to you know sort of piping uh, inputs right. into, into other commands. So that's it's a very similar concept here. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you know, speaking of PowerShell and, and PowerShell and scripting, right? F Sharp has this really neat uh, sort of feature, F Sharp Interactive, which provides you with scripting capabilities for F Sharp. So you know, personally for me, um, you know, if I need to write up a script or something like that to do something, you know, whether it's you know analyze looking at files or whatever it may be. Um, personally, I just go for F sharp, right? Um, so, so, so you have that as well. Um, let's see here. So yeah, so there's piping and then composition is this composition operator here where, for example, if you know that um, there's a series of functions where the input of one is actually can be piped nicely into, into another function, um, you can sort of combine them into one. So instead of having, um, you know, in, instead of having this uh, pipe operator have apply the square and then add one because both of them, I believe in this case, take an integer, you can just combine them and say square and add one into a single sort of uh, function. You can say that it's a single function and then apply that single function rather than having multiple functions uh, next to each other um, or, or, or using the pipe operator here. Um, so listen array and sequences. Um, this is basically how you go ahead, uh, how you would use them, right? And again, one of the really neat things is you're able to apply um, operations in this case you're using a lambda to um, this list of numbers right and you can you can do different types of operations there's a lot that are actually built in to the uh, to the language right that make it really easy to perform basic operations like sorting filtering um, performing arithmetic and and all sorts of operations um, and then there's recursion right with this rec um, sort of keyword here you're able to apply recursive function or define recursive functions in F sharp. Um, you also have pattern matching here, as you can see, and it's a, it's a really powerful feature as well. Um, and then come the types, right? So records are discriminated unions, records are, you know, it's something that in C sharp, you're really starting to, you know, you're, you're starting to see now um, becoming part of the language. Um, but in, in 
F sharp, it's it's been around for, for quite some time. So if you're familiar with that, right, definitely, uh, you know, it, it works in a similar similar sort of manner um, here. And then with discriminated unions, we can see them here, right? You have this way of describing sort of types. For example, here, this is a, you know, this is a playing cards, right? You can define that hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades, uh, it, they're, they're suits, right? And it could be, it's sort of like an or relationship here. Right, where it can either a card can either be uh, uh, hearts, clubs, diamonds, spades, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to perform uh, things like pattern matching and 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 other really powerful um, sort of logic for building out, you know, your your applications. Um, let's see, the discriminated unions, pattern matching. I kind of mentioned that briefly, and yeah, so definitely take a look. Oh, this is another one that's actually really interesting that you might want to check out, which is optional types um, in in F sharp. There isn't really, while you can't have null values, that's not really a thing. And option types really help you handle sort of missing data or, or working with, with code where instead of, you know, handling a null, which may not, you know, you know, it may not necessarily throw compile errors when you're handling that inside of your application, right? With the option type, that sort of forces you to be safe and build uh, safe code, especially when there are areas where, where there may be missing data. Um, use of measure, it's really interesting. You can also have object programming in F sharp, right? Um, and yeah, there's it sort of takes you to the next steps in this document in terms of you know what can you do uh, to get started, as well as a few tutorials uh, and a language reference for for getting started with F sharp. So, so I, yeah. I I have I have so that actually leads to a question that I have for Isaac, and maybe Isaac can help me with this. I have been struggling with my F sharp aha moment. Right. You know how it is when you're looking at something new and you're waiting for that moment where it clicks. I haven't had that yet. Mm. And I'm, I'm hoping to have it today. And I'm, I'm looking at you, Isaac. So <laughs> no, no pressure whatsoever. Right. Yeah, I did actually uh, prepare one, one slide and one slide only just for, in case someone did ask this, like, what is the magic sort of secret source uh, of F sharp? Um, I don't know if you can just share my screen just so I can show this one slide. Uh, Let's do it. There. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. So, um, so I'm I'm ready for I'm ready for my red pill. Yeah, it, <laughs> I think it's um when when people are often trying to say you know um what what feature is it about F sharp that makes it so great? It's it's that there is no one feature. Um and, and in fact when when people ask me like what are those great features? It's like if you go through every different feature and just say oh, it's got this, it's got that, it's got this, it's got that, it just gets really confusing because you're like throwing 20 different concepts all at once and it's, it's a lot to take in. And um, there, there is no one feature. It's almost like the combination of, of what the language has, but also what it doesn't have. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that in C Sharp we have and we sort of rely on that, that F Sharp actually said, we don't want those things. We're going to take a different approach. So you don't have like easy mutability. You can do it, but you have to put in extra keywords. Um, you can do classes, but it kind of makes it harder to do inheritance and things like that. And it takes a, a kind of a different approach. And I think for me, the magic moment was when I actually said, right, I'm going to build a simple, like the next time I do a hobby project, I'm just going to bite the bullet and say, right, I'm going to do it in F sharp. And it's going to take me ages that first week. And it's going to be quite hard and, and, and annoying. Thank God now there are a lot better resources than there were six, seven years ago. So there's, you know, online, there's lots of YouTube videos, there's books and, and like Slack channels, which just weren't there then. So it's a bit more approachable, but it really is. If you really want to sort of get that moment, that aha moment, it's like try and do something in F sharp, spend a few hours, you know, writing an app, and then maybe try and do it again in C sharp or vice versa to see what the differences are. And you probably then can appreciate better, like, oh, I would have modeled it like this in C sharp. I would have used mm -hmm. inheritance, or I would have used that. Oh, this is a really nice way of doing it in F sharp, or vice versa, sort of thing. Right. So, um, I, I think, yeah, reading um, reading a book will, will get you so far, but you, you just have to do it. You really just have to do it. Believe me, if I knew how to answer that question in like one sentence, I would just retire on that. But but it's uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it's like you just got to do it. Yeah, and Fuel Savelle here sort of echoes that sentiment, uh, right? That the way that that Fuel got into F Sharp is just made it main language until you know they got it, and after two weeks they just got it and just stopped doing C Sharp completely. Um, you know, per personally for me, right? I was coming from like a Python, JavaScript type background, um, but I still felt it lacking in the sense that you know you want to build safe code and the compiler in a lot of you know in a lot of senses helps you do that, right? 
Um, so for me, F Sharp was just sort of that middle ground where it's like you got you have succinct code that you can write, um, while at the same time, um, you know, you can you can leverage the compiler um, and have that backing you the entire way to to, to check for those errors, right? Um, especially for example, if you're using something like, um, you know, if you're doing something like uh, like building neural networks, for example, right? Uh, there's all these inputs and outputs that are going in where the, in, in Python, it's not gonna complain, right? It's not gonna tell you, hey, this matrix or whatever sort of data structure that you have here doesn't match, the inputs don't match with the outputs. So, you know, try again and with, with a sharp or with a, with a language like a sharp, um, you know, having the compiler telling you those errors, right? It, it really helps you just write safer code. So that for me, that's kind of what won me over. Yeah. Okay. So with that, I think we should hop into the meat of our discussion, our hallway track. Isaac, the floor is yours. Okay. So should I just go through and, uh, do a few things that I want to show off or? Yeah, please. Cool. Um, I think the, the thing I usually just start off with is if you've never seen F-sharp before it's, and you're coming from a .NET background, it's just .NET at the end of the day. So, you know, if you've been using .NET Core, you know, the same sort of things that you're used to, like .NET new console. In my case, I've actually switched the default so I don't have to say lang F-sharp. So it does F-sharp by default. If you're a C-sharp dev, then you basically have to just type uh, the same things but you'd have to do dash dash lang f sharp to just say uh, create a console app in f sharp. But um, all of the same sort of tools that you would expect. So I've got a project file and I can put NuGet references in there. That sort of thing just works. It's just okay. It's creating me a very basic sort of um, um, uh, hello world, but I'm actually going to just kill that and create my own one. And I thought while I was doing this, you could sort of see um, some of the tooling integration in, in Visual Studio Code show you maybe in Visual Studio as well, and maybe um, a quick web app as well, if we've got time as well. Um, so I'll just do something really simple, like um, name equals this. And this is basically like the most basic sort of um, keyword in F-sharp, it's let. So the closest would be in um, C-sharp would be something like read-only var or something like that. So it's a read-only thing that says, you know, name is equal to Lewis, nothing nothing too difficult there. And on the right here, we get this little nice type hint that's like the compiler's figured out this is a string based on the right hand side. And then I could do something like printfm, which is pretty much like console write line. And I could say something like, hello world, and I'll just use string interpolation. So I've got my little program here, and then I can just type .net run. There's sort of a, a really basic console application, but it's using like all of the features that, that we would expect to see in a .NET app. So it's using you know project system, solution if we want it, compiler, you know console output, all of that sort of stuff. So um, you can also access all the .NET namespaces. So I've got you know system there, and I could do things like system dot and I get IntelliSense. You know this is all the same sort of things that you would expect to see in a in a C sharp app. So the whole .NET framework or you know, BCL, it's all there for you to use. Yeah. So, so, so far, so far, I'm not feeling like I'm like I, like I woke up in the twilight zone. So far, yeah, this exactly. is all familiar. Exactly. Uh, however, uh, to, this looks a little bit weird to me, you know, uh, in the sense that you just create, you have your program.fs file, right? Which would be similar to that program.cs file. But where's my main method? Where's my entry point? Yeah. So, this is actually something that now you have in C Sharp, I believe, now in the latest um, C Sharp. Um, uh, nine, which is uh, these um, single file um, applications where you don't need to sort of create a main method. So F# -sharp's always had this from the start. You can create a main method if you really want to. So I can put in something like this, and I can say these are my args, and then I can decorate this with something like entry point, which is this. It's almost like the same as in um, C# -sharp where you say you know this is the entry point to my app, and this is just a longhand way really of doing what I've just done, except I can also get to the args. So do 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 all method declarations in F sharp then are they all set up like this like this declaration syntax where you're saying okay take this you know let main equal you know is it let yeah, you know yeah. foo equal whatever like that absolutely so you only need let so I can say let x equals ten but I can also say uh, let add which takes in x and y equals x plus y and that's a function as well 
Okay. Different really there. Um, one of the really cool things that I see here that's sort of the tooling at work is those little annotations towards the side. Um, could you could you talk a little bit more about those and, and sort of in that one, what's that in in int uh, telling us there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the really cool things about F sharp is that the type inference engine. So if you use C sharp and you've used var before, then you know you can say sort of, you know, var x equals Isaac, and the compiler will realize that this is a string. In F sharp, effectively everything can be inferred. So like here, the compiler has basically said, well, I'm adding X and Y together. I'm gonna to assume that add, or the default for add means I'm adding two numbers together. So this is saying add is a function that takes in an int and another int and then gives back a final int. So X plus Y equals another integer. Um, if I change so, that, sorry, go on. So I was gonna say, how, so it just, but it's just going to assume that those are integers then. But then, like, I, th I think you were about to lead into the answer to my question. I was going to say, but what about string concatenation? Yep. So now I've changed this to a string. Now they've all changed to string because the compiler has said, well, Isaac's now said we've got a string here. That must mean these must all be strings. Right? Because you can't, one of, one of the things you can't do in F sharp is implicit conversions. So the compiler can assume if I was to say this is a float, for example, 10.5. He knows they're all floats now because you can't implicitly add an int to a float in F sharp. It's stricter than that. So it can make this assumption because there's, there's no other value that X could be or Y could be. And if I would actually annotate this and say X is an integer, I'll actually now get a compiler error. Uh, what's the compiler for example? I believe that should do. Let's just compile that and see what we get. So I've got an error here that says float does not match int. So, so, and I, I was about to ask, and I think you just answered it. Uh, if, if I wanted a like a concatenation function, like a let concatenate whatever, so I would, I would define it as let concatenate, and then x is string and y is string. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Absolutely. Gotcha. Yeah. Most of the time you don't need to, but if you do want to, yeah, enforce that, then, then absolutely, then you would do something like this, you know, and we'll call it concat, for example. Right. You know, there we go, sort of thing. Um, the, the, yeah, exactly right. Um, and then you could just use it as normal. So I could then say concat, for example, and then you know, off we go, sort of thing. Um, interestingly, down down here we've got this thing um, in the terminal called F Sharp Interactive, which I think Louis sort of touched on. Now imagine you're writing your app and you just want to test this function out. I can highlight the code, just shift, and I can hit Alt Enter. And what that's going to do is actually compile this function into this kind of um, interactive console at the bottom. So think of this as like the immediate window in C Sharp when you're running your .NET apps, except it's there when I'm editing code as well. So I can now call this function and actually test what it does while I'm working. So I can try it out, explore my domain. I don't have to write a console test rig or run the app to get to the point. I can just execute the code arbitrarily, which is really quite quite nice to just explore, experiment with something. Does it look good? Does it work? Does the API look nice? And then just carry on as, as normal, which is which is pretty cool. So, so in that concat function, um, you have x plus y. How how does how does it know what to return or like how how do you tell? In functions like what what you should return. So uh, in F sharp, um, everything is an expression, which means that everything has a return value. There is no such thing as like void or, or like statements, really. So if I wanted to make this kind of a, a multi-line function, let's say um, concat value equals, and then I'm actually going to add on something to that. Um, let's just say hello, sort of thing. The last expression in a function is always the return. So you don't have to put in like the return keyword like that. It's it's effectively implicit. It's just the last line in a function is always the return value. Um, it's a, what's real quick? What's defining the boundary of the of the of the function there? So, is, is it is it white space or? Yeah, it's white space. So in F sharp, you don't have like the curly brace for scope. You just indent, and as long as they line up, then life is good. And You'll, I don't know if you can see here, I've actually got a little coloring here. So this is just a nice extension in um, VS Code that makes sure that all the alignment is correct. So if I 
do like this, get a little red squiggly that says, hang on a minute, now you've indented that, something might not be right here. Um, and, and you can you can indefinitely nest these sorts of things. So I could put in something like this and say plus test. So now I've got a little scope in here, and then I've got the bigger scope there. So you can just arbitrarily create little scopes where you can you can have values. You know, so if I was to say let z equals there and then return z, I can't access z from here. It doesn't exist. It was only as part of that scope there. But, um, that's, you can effectively do the same in C-sharp. I don't think anyone ever does it, but you can sort of just create little braces um, around code to, to do that sort of thing. Right, yeah. F-sharp's also got really good support for um, generics when it comes to this sort of type inference. So let's say I wanted to make a, a normal system collection, you know, a generic list. Um, so let's call it numbers. And let's open up system collections generic and then make a list. So normally you would do something like this, right? New list uh, event. Um, in F-sharp, you can omit the new keyword. You don't need that. And you can also skip out the generic argument if you want. And the compiler will figure it out based on how you're using the function. So here I've said numbers add 10. Therefore, this must be a list of integers. And you can see the, the, the type hint changes there. So if I was to make that a string, now this is a list of strings. So real quick, so I'm, I'm noticing, you know, you've pointed out the, the tooling here and like the tooling is showing us that it's inferred that that's a, a list of type string. Um, what extensions provide all this? Is this like, is this like a standard like extension pack that, that people would, would want to use with F sharp or are there, um, you know, specific extensions you'd like to recommend? So um, there's the only extension that you really need is this ionide extension. So this is like the, the, the effectively the, unofficial official um, sort of recommended F-sharp extension for, for F-sharp um, in Visual Studio Code. You don't need this, obviously, for Visual Studio. That's got great support built in as well. Um, but that's really the only extension you'll need to get up and running that will give you like the type hints, the coloring, um, the, the interactive support, basically everything in there. There are a bunch of other extensions that you might want to use. Um, so things like, for example, the that sort of uh, four spacing one, um, so there are a couple of other ones like bracket lens. So if you've got indented brackets, it will give you special colors. Um, and I think that one I've got is the indent. Uh, let's see what it's called. Uh, I've got a link. I'll send you guys later. You can post with some blog. Uh, blog What's in the chat? Is that is it indent rainbow? Uh, could well be that one. Let me just have a quick skim through here and see if I can find. I've got too many extensions here. Uh, indent rainbow. Absolutely right. That's exactly it. Um, so yeah, uh, and then that really is, is is a good place to start um, in in that regard. So yeah, and you know you get the usual sort of mouse overs and things. There's also some support as well. So I can sort of have to and then say the answer. And oh, looks like a, the version of i9 I've got I think is a preview version. So that may have just been broken there, but normally you can hit F2 and sort of refactor things like that. It will give you those sorts of, you know, it's not, um, don't expect F sharp sort of tooling support to be C sharp, re sharper level. That's not what the language is about. Um, but if you compare it to most other uh, functional languages, F sharp is basically streets head, particularly if you're looking at things like Rider, which has got really good F sharp support, Visual Studio, um, VS Code, they've all got really good support. Um, you know, if you look at languages maybe like Haskell or other FP languages, they're just not in the same ballpark as F# -sharp really when it comes to the tooling, which is great. And you've still got the whole .NET behind the scenes as well, which is great. Right. Yeah, I mean that's um, you know I certainly have tried uh, looking at other functional programming languages, um, but one of the things that sort of keeps keeps bringing me back or why I really tend to like F# -sharp is that it's it's very pragmatic, it's very practical, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about helping you getting things done, uh, you know, get things done rather than, um, you know, those languages, of course, have, have their benefits, right? But, uh, you know, if I just want to get things done, uh, you know, I, I always find that F-sharp is a good good place to to do that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. A lot of, like, F-sharp developers have their backgrounds like me in C-sharp and O sort of languages. So it's not like many, F, most F-sharp devs are coming from the sort of the, the mathematical scientific sort of educational background, but most people are just used to writing line of business apps 
web applications, you know, data-driven apps, SQL apps, that they just choose to do it in F-sharp today for the language, but they still don't want to give up the, the, the great stuff about .NET. Um, so it's kind of the, the best of both worlds. Um, I'll just show you the um, last thing that you were showing earlier, Luis, which is like the module system. So you can just think of a module as um, just like a static class, really. So all that's saying is now I've got a module called functions, and inside that I've got a function called concat. And then when I want to reference it, I can just do something like functions.concat. It's just like, you know, just think of that as a as a holding place for, for class uh, for, for, for functions. Now, of course, we have this all in program.fs here. So like in C sharp, would I just like have like another F sharp file? The compiler would just figure out where everything lives, or would I have to um would I have to like explicitly point things out in the project file or something like that? Right. So you would have a separate project for your F sharp code, just like you have a VB proj for your VB code. So you can't mix and match um, multiple languages in .NET, but you could have two projects and then reference one from the other. Well, I guess I guess more of my question was the so you you said functions is like a static class in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had another FS file there that was a peer of program.fs oh, and I had and I had functions living in there like a functions.fs that yeah. that would be fine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. There's no that, that that name can be anything you want. Um, that FS file name, just like in C sharp. But once you've got um, sort of the other file in your project, then you can just sort of open namespaces and open modules and access them like you would do in, in C sharp. The same kind of principles. No, no. There's only one restriction in F sharp, which is you can't access um, a, a value or a type until it's been declared. So in C sharp, you can like call something and then declare it later on in the project. In F sharp, it's got a linear one way flow. So, for example, oh. if I create a function here, right, let's say foo, I can't call concat in there. doesn't know what it is. So it feels a little like a scripting language there, right? Yeah, but uh, it's a bit different um, now that now, now works. There, there's some good things and some bad things. The first like instinct of everyone is, Ugh, this is really like crazy. I, I really don't like that. But there's some really nice things about this. One is... If you open a project up and you want to know what is this guy depending on, what is this code depending on, the answer is always the stuff above. It can never be anything that's declared later. And it's then impossible to, to, to have spaghetti code. A references B references C references A. You literally can't do that. Um, so it makes things a lot more simple in that regard. Well, uh, conversely, I, now I just you know to, to stand up for you know a language like C sharp. Uh, conversely, I I like the ability to have like a lightweight like program.fs, like an entry point that is like, all right, we're going to do task A and then we're going to do task B and then we're going to do task C. And then task A is defined somewhere else and task B and C are also defined somewhere else. And we really don't want to worry about that at this point. I just want you, the programmer, coming into my code to look at this entry point and go, oh, it's task A, task B, and task C. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I see that as being, um, th that new way of thinking there, I think would be, uh, a stumbling block for a lot of people. It, yeah, it absolutely does catch a lot of people out. Um, believe me, I can only ask you to trust me when I say that that kind of um, recoil disappears pretty quickly. And um, it, normally what you'll have in your project will typically be something like, uh, let's just create a comment here. It'll normally be something like types or, or maybe some, uh, something like domain.fs. So maybe your types as the first file, and then maybe some functions other functions, you know, some other stuff. And then right at the bottom, you'll then have program.fs. And this one can access all of these. And this can access this and so on. And at the very top of all your types, that, that, that's the, the, the root of your program effectively. Uh, that's a very different model in C-Shot where you tend to have like one class per file, right? You'll normally have class A you know, and class two. In F sharp, because it's so succinct and easy to define types, you tend to only need really one physical file where you can actually store almost all of your domain in. Um, and I can show you that, like, for example, if I want to make a record called person, I can just do something like name is string, and let's say um, company is string. And that's like a full class where I've got a constructor, 
Um, these are all getter-only properties, and the constructor takes both of those fields in. So if you've done anything with C-sharp 9, this is basically what records are. It, it's similar. And they're all immutable fields, um, and all public as well. So, so, so just to make sure I'm really clear on this, what... Okay, I, I was looking at some of the comments from from viewers while while you were saying this. What determines the order that the the, the uh, F sharp files are are? I mean, yeah. that the compiler evaluates them. Are, is is that alphabetical or is that? It's the order in the actual project file. That's the order. So okay. Okay. File here, you know, the main mm -hmm. .fs. Gotcha. Yep. Then you just have to add it in here. And if you do it in Visual Studio or you use the command line, then it will do this for you. Um, but now I've got these two files in my project, and I could move this into that file, and then you know now it's accessible from the other one as well. So we have a, a few questions um, from the you know during the conversation here that I'd like to surface if we can. Yeah, um, we had this question: Why do we need to pass open paren close paren for a function definition when no parameters are passed? So. Um, so the, the, the question, just so I make sure I understand this, so it's let um, foo equals one, two, three. Um, why do we need this? Um, and some others, right? So in F sharp, in, in um, C sharp, these are just like parentheses, right? And they're the placeholders for the arguments in the middle. Yeah? Like right. In, in F sharp, this is actually a value. This is actually a thing in F sharp called unit. It's actually a value that says I'm the I'm um, the argument that has no actual content. Think of it as like a, an object that has no data in it. Okay. Yeah. And this is saying foo is a function that, and it must be if if it wasn't this, then it wouldn't be a function. It's just a value. Then. Right. Yeah? This is saying it's a function that takes in a unit, so it takes in no arguments or no data as arguments, and it will return the value one two three when you call it. So I can literally say data equals that. That's actually valid F sharp. It's actually a real thing. This is a, a value. It's not just syntax like you have in, in, in C sharp. And I can even say foo data. I'm I'm actually processing a that thing. for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I'm I'm having so I'm I'm looking down at the at the uh, F sharp interactive. I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. what foo data represents at that point. So Okay, so foo is a function. Uh-huh. Takes in one argument, which type is unit. So okay. I could have taken two arguments if I wanted. Let's call it x, which is an integer. So now we've got two things. The first argument is a thing of type unit, and the second uh -huh. thing is within. So just think of unit as, as a type. And right. you'll see a fair few C-sharp projects actually would like this sort of thing integrated into C-sharp. Because it's a way of actually, it gets rid of the need for void. It's, it's basically saying every function takes in something. And this is now saying, well, create an instance of that. You don't need to do this, though. I just wanted to, to, to show you that. But now I'm saying here, call unit and one, two, three. So that's okay. the first argument, and that's the second. So it's a way of basically saying, I want to create a function that doesn't take any inputs in. F sharp doesn't let you have a function with no inputs. You must always have an input for a function. Even if that input is the absence of a value, it's nothing. It's just a, a placeholder, if you will. Okay, that makes yeah. that makes more sense. So I, I notice here that we've been uh, rated. Uh, Jedi Wing Knight sort of points it out. So for folks who are just joining, we are here with Isaac talking about F Sharp, and he's just showing us a few of features of the language and get, giving an introduction uh, into the language. So we we and on that note, we had a question a little earlier that I've been I've been holding back just because I, I feel like it's probably going to be a, a, a an explanation that takes us away from some of the things that Isaac has been showing us um, Jose wanted to know more about monads oh, God. It had to do it, <laughs> had to do it. Um, could you explain what is a monad I'll, I'll be honest um, any you don't need to know to use F sharp I would say I don't really know the, the mathematical um, Sort of definition of it, and I'm not going to give you the sort of the, the really complex answers that people sort of learn parrot fashion, sort of, and just reply. What I'll say is, um, uh, the, the long and short of it is, a monad is just this um, 
this way of working with like an effect. So I'll give you some ideas of effects in .NET that you might already know in C Sharp. Things like nullable, things like task, things like, um, what other ones have we got? What other generic sort of types do we work with in .NET quite regularly? Um, the the are... comments, I was just gonna say, the comments in the chat are making me feel like I stepped on a landmine unknowingly. Yeah, like yeah. A landmine specifically set out for, for a host yeah. who doesn't know F sharp and just knows C sharp. You, you, um, you don't need to know them, but it's really just, um, it's, it's a way of working with these sorts of things. List is another one. So where you've got this kind of common pattern. So think of like nullable. When you're working with nullable data, you always want to check, is there a value before I do something with it? And with tasks, it's, has this thing returned back before I continue with my code? Mm -hmm. And with lists, it's, do I have some data in the list or is it an empty list? And a monad is, is basically a way of kind of trying to encapsulate that pattern and say, right, I want to do something like five plus 10 without having to worry, is this null or not? Yeah? Or task, has this returned or not? This is an async, you know, a task of int. Has it come back before I can do this sort of thing? Or a list. Here's a list of numbers. Are there any things in it? If so, I want to add another list together. It's a way of trying to uh, hold on to that kind of, that, that repeated pattern that you're doing all the time with this type and encapsulate it and try and hide it from you. Okay. And, and I, I'm getting the feeling also from additional comments in the chat yeah. that like that 30,000 foot view that you just gave us is probably yeah. more than sufficient. Yeah, we don't need to go any further, believe me. Um, it will end in tears and it won't, it won't be a useful, uh, it won't be a productive use of the next 20 minutes. Um, and I'll probably just end up embarrassing myself. So I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, so, okay, good. So um, that's kind of the, the basics. I wouldn't mind just showing a bit about the domain modeling side of the language. Um, and maybe some scripts. And then if we've got five minutes left, maybe just a quick web app, um, just to show you that you can sort of take it to the max sort of thing. Um, so I'm just gonna create a, a script file. So let's call it a modeling. So you can create a script file just by putting the X on the end. And you can actually do this with C Sharp today as well. You can create CSX files. Um, F Sharp's had scripting like from, from the start. Um, I'll just create a really simple kind of model, which I, I really like, um, and it's really, um, it's really kind of a nice example of something. Let's say I had a customer with the name, which is string, and maybe um, country, um, which is, let's call it a string as well. And then let's do something like a contact method. And I'm just gonna leave this as, as obvious for now. Um, but let's assume we wanted to model this with something like, um, you can have either one of three contact methods, like email, post, or telephone. And a customer can only have one of those three things. And if you've got an email, you've got obviously an address. If you've got a post, you've got you know address one, two, three, line one, two, three. And if it's telephone, then you know number sort of thing. And think about how you would model this in C sharp today in an object oriented world. You know, we've got a class with name and country. How would you model that contact method? What are there, I would probably uh, define a, a contact method interface or, or base type of some kind. Yeah, exactly. So you'd probably make a base class called, you know, contactable or something. And then you'd have email as a, as a subclass and post as another subclass and telephone as a third subclass. And then you'd have some kind of, kind of polymorphic, you know, dispatch. Where you'd have a sort of a dot contact. Um, right. You probably would be, you may not be too surprised. Some people can't, don't do that. And they'll do something like this instead. They'll say um, email details, and you know, maybe that's the string, and it would be null if it's not used. And you know, post details, string, you know, or address line, let's even do it properly. Let's say address line one, string, and address line two, string, and maybe let's do telephone. And let's make that a string plot just for fun. And how do I know now which one is being used? Well, maybe I'll do something like, well, I'll check email. If that's null, then it can't be email, then it must be one of these other guys. Or maybe I'll create an enum that says contact method and so on. Um, yeah. F-Shop are a much more succinct way of modeling this kind of mutual exclusion or all, which are called union types. You can say contact method is one of email, 
or address or telephone. And then I can replace this whole thing with one of those. So contact is of type contact method. And this looks like an enum at the moment, just a slightly different syntax, but where um, f -sharp really comes in nicely is I can add in data across each of these different things. So I can say that's an email address, which is a string. So if it's email, then I'm gonna store this information. If it's an address, then I wanna store line one, which is a string, line two, which is a string, and let's uh, put postcode, which is also a string. And this is kind of just inline record syntax, um, or I could say phone number. So we've now got this kind of domain where I've got these three types. And if you compile this and look at this from a C sharp project, it does exactly what you just said, Cam. You get a base class called contact method, and then you get an email inherited class, and you get an address and a telephone. So each of these are separate classes. What and that was that was my next question: is what the what does this look like, you know, outside, you know, to another assembly? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just um, three classes. I mean, at the end of the day, F sharp compiled down to, to to IL. So the only things it's got are lambdas, um, classes, and maybe tuples, and, and not much more really. And tuples are classes as well. Um, so, so we've got that sort of thing, and then I can sort of create one. So if I wanted to say Isaac, I could say, let's make one of those. And I can say name equals Isaac. And then you'll see actually now what's quite cool is the compiler's already realized this is a customer. I never said the word customer here, but the compiler's figured it out because it said name equals. And the only type that's in scope that has a name is a customer. Huh. And it's actually then said, look, no assignment given for country. You've actually not done that one yet. And then I can say generate record stuff. It's now given me that. So let's say now Germany. And then contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah Carl, I, I, it, the, the, the aha is happening. I think you're seeing it in real time. OK, cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and let's do this then. So let's say Isaac at compositionalit.com. So now I've created an email. And, you don't need the new keyword. You don't need the, the brackets. You can just say email, and then it takes in an email address. So now I've got a contact, and I've got a country. The big difference is to, to the OO ways. You had, you know, we said you'd have a polymorphic method before for your sort of contact. Here in, in F-Shop, we go the other way. You have a single function that says, I want to do contact over any kind of customer. And then what we do is pattern match. And this is like where people look, ugh. This is a bit weird. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the opposite of what I'm taught in OO, where you have, you know, you can add in methods and you, and you put it across all method, all our types. Here we go the other way. So I can say I want to match over the contact method with, if it's email, which has an address, I then want to say, uh, let's say, emailing And I've got to handle the other two cases now, which was address and telephone. And you'll see the compiler's already given me a warning here. You've not handled the address case. So now it's forcing me to deal with that. So I can go down here and I can say address details. Say sending a letter to details dot, and then I get line one, line two, and postcode. So the compiler knows based on these three fields. It's an address which has a record of those three fields in it. So I'm just going to do that to start with. And then the last one was telephone, which has some number. It's a ringing number. Now, the great thing is if I was to add in another type up here, let's do, um, I don't know, direct message in Twitter, I get a warning now again from the compiler. You've added direct message, but you've not handled it here. So this is the, the sort of the other way of doing it compared to um, polymorphism. Um, the, the good thing about this is that it makes it, uh, if, you're, if your types have lots of new behaviors that you're adding all the time, this is really great because you can add any arbitrary function without changing your base class, your type hierarchy. I can add a new function now called, um, I don't know, fire person or hire customer or something. And this can be declared anywhere in my code base. It's got nothing to do with the, with the types. 
Whereas if you think the OO way, you want to add a behavior, you have to go through every every inherited type and add that method onto it. Right. Right. Pain is in this approach, every time you add a new type, you've got to go through every function and add the new handler. Right. <clears throat> but in most cases, in my experience, you tend to define these types up front and they rarely change. You're adding lots of behaviors all the new time, all, all the time. So that's where it's it's really powerful. Um, Right, sure so to gone. add functions, right? Like exactly. It's, yeah. Exactly. Um, let's do one last demo on, on the, sorry, the modeling side, and then I'm going to move out on um, let's do UK and then Germany, and then let's leave it as those two. And let's say an address, I'm going to add a, a new field here. Um, actually, let's do, let's change this to just for now be um, string. I'm just going to simplify this. Say, so I've just simplified this for a minute to make it a single field. And what I now want to say is addresses is a tuple of the, the, the line, one of the address, and also country. And the compiler is going to complain here, and it's going to say, well, you need to this isn't right. You've only put in one argument, I need two, so that's fine. Do that. And what is really nice with pattern matching is I can do stuff like this. I can say if it's uh, an address, line one, and the country is UK, do this. Now I've got a compiler warning again. You've not handled the case for Germany. Right. So it actually understands. The, 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 the way this works. So I can then add in another handler here and say, whatever. Um, and the compiler will basically go through and make sure that you've handled every conceivable case. So if I was even to say something like London here, the compiler will give another warning saying the value A wasn't handled. So the uh, and the value a in that case is just arbitrary, I guess. Is yeah, it, it, just like... through. it will just keep going. But if you've got union types like this, it will be really you know it will figure out every possible combination, almost like a truth table, where you have to work out every permutation for every dimension, and it will make sure that you've handled every case. So imagine you've got something like country, and maybe you had different towns or or, or different contact methods. It's the combination of all of these things that the compiler will help you. Which is really so. I, I'm 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 getting the feeling that this is like a very you know we we had a comment from a viewer earlier that this is a very pattern matching intensive language. Like if like yeah. like you're going to understand pattern matching after you work with F sharp for a while. Absolutely. I mean, you've got if then for conditional matching, um, but you don't really use it as much. Um, switch case is basically pattern matching, but just slightly slightly less less powerful. Pattern matching is basically the, the, the way that you do any kind of conditional matching normally in F sharp. So you've got functions, you've got types, and then for like logic, what do I do in this case? That's when you use pattern matching. Gotcha. Yep. Okay, cool. We've just got like six, seven minutes left. I think we should have time. And how much time do you need to round up, guys? Just uh, not a lot. So yeah, yeah. well, and and we can run over. The, okay. We have padding built into the schedule. Okay, great. So I'm just going to show you. Um, a web app. So this is like a full end-to-end -end F sharp app. Um, and it's basically um, this, you can look online. Um, I'll just show you the link really, really quickly, uh, which is called SafeStack. So I'll send you the link. You can put it on later. Um, if you Google SafeStack F sharp, it's like the first link. Um, and it's basically that our idea is, is the best way to write functional web apps in um, in .NET or, um, or indeed anywhere really. So I basically just created a brand new one. It's .NET new safe, and I'm just going to kick it off with .NET run. And while it's doing this in the background, I'm just going to sort of take you through a quick tour of what is actually um, what is actually going on here. So we basically have um, let's ignore that. We've got a, a source folder with three different projects in it. We've got a server project, which is actually just ASP.NET backend. It doesn't look like that from here. Um, it's got this thing called application block, but this is like a, an F sharp library that sits on top of ASP.NET core. Right. So, yeah, I see some recognizable things poking through. Yeah, exactly. So it's um, 
you know, you'll see like at the bottom here when this starts running, you, you'll see the normal sort of ASP.NET core I've started up thing. Um, and the client is actually all in um, F sharp still, but in reality, it all gets compiled down to JavaScript. So this is huh. like F sharp, normal, everything we just saw before, you know, types and uh, union types and functions and all this sort of stuff. But actually, behind the scenes, if you look in this um, console window, you'll see NPM is actually downloading the universe, you know, as it always does when you start a new project. Um, <laughs> but, you, but you can see this one line here, Fable, F sharp to JS compiler. And this so, is so the one. So I was, that was, so Fable is the, is the compiler project, and it's part of the stack. Yeah, exactly. So it's a .NET okay. tool. And you can basically just do things like .NET Fable, F sharp file, and it will give you a JS file out if you really want. But we've hooked it all in with with sort of the normal JavaScript world. So you've got things like you know package JSON for NuGet packages, uh, NuGet npm packages. We're using Webpack, so all the standard things that you would expect to see in a sort of a single page app. Um, and it's compiling now. You'll see that I've now got uh, Webpack is running, Fable's running. Once that started, I end up with a, a basically a, a React app, but it's actually going to be using F sharp. Um, for, for, for basically both sides. And the really nice thing is, if ever you've done any web programming, um, the biggest challenge you have is, unless you're using things like Blazor, if you're doing something like you know Angular on the front end and C Sharp on the back end, is how do I share my types? Mm -hmm. You know, How do I make sure that the client and the server is the same? Well, because here we've got the same language, we can basically have a shared project that on the client will be compiled down to JavaScript, and on the server is compiled into IL. So we don't actually have to sort of worry about, um, you know, are the fields the same? Are they kept in sync? That's my sort of, it's a to-do app. So I've got here a, a to-do of a good and a description of what is the to-do. I've got some shared business logic here, and that's available on the client and the server, um, which is quite nice there, you know, and it's pretty impressive what it does, you know, this Fable um, library and some of the stuff that's sort of built up around it. Let me just, uh, let's see, it looks like we're okay here. So let me open up. The browser and see if we can actually get to this. So it's a local host eighty eighty. See if it started. So Webpack is still thinking about it. Um, so this is actually Fable's all done. .NET's done. Here we go. So let's try that once more. There we go. So I've got here an app, and we've got some to-do items. I can sort of type in here and say, um, "Learn F sharp," and then add. That's going back to the server. What's really good is taking this kind of approach where we want to play with the JavaScript ecosystem. We can use all the nice things that Webpack and the JS ecosystem already have. So they've had, um, like in the new version of .NET 6, we've got this like hot module loading thing, hot reload. That's been like a, a core part of JavaScript for years. And I can actually do the same thing in now F Sharp. I can go onto my client page. And let's find like this button here called Add. Um, and I can say Create instead. I'm going to hit Save. And with a bit of luck, now it says there Create. So I haven't re like stopped the app, started the app. I've literally just typed something in, hit Save. Fable's recompiled it to JavaScript, and then Webpack has said, oh, it's changed. Let's update our, our client app. And this is nothing that we've built on the safe stack. That's like right. JavaScript uh, had that for years. We're just sort of piggybacking onto it because we just compiled to JS. So we get all the nice things that that has. We get you know source maps, the, the React ecosystem, sort of debug tools. That's all there. We've not built any of that stuff. So you can write like ASP.NET on the back end, you know, .NET 5 really fast. You've got JavaScript on the front end, huge ecosystem, but you've got mm -hmm. like F sharp across both of them. You've got this really rich type system, really powerful on both sides. So my mind is kind of blown. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm seeing that I have, uh, I certainly have no excuse now not to dive in and uh, and play with things because you know as a web developer that that I it, that fable that you just showed off is uh, really kind of impressive. Um, to wind down the the hour just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, we have one final question uh, from the learning deck who said that they they read your book 
and yep. it's a, they, they feel like it's a little dated now. Um, they want to know if you have any new resources that you can share or anything else that you'd like to uh, point our, our viewers to. Yeah, I'd say um, the best place these days to look for like the most up-to-date resources for like learning F-sharp and so on, there's probably a few. Um, the, the doc site that you showed, Luis, is, is relatively recent, which is pretty good as a kind of a reference guide. Um, there's a really good Slack channel. So if you register on F-sharp org, which is like the home of F-sharp from a community point of view, you can register for free and you can go onto a, a Slack group that F-sharp org manages. And there's like beginners channels, there's web channels, there's all sorts um, on there. So that's really um, a, a good place I would say to go. Um, there are a couple of other good books. So Kit Eason has written a book called Stylish F-sharp, which is kind of, uh, in my opinion, it's like if you've read my book and you want to sort of go to the next level now, that's a really good book to look at as well. Um, I'm just showing you Slack here. So there's all sorts of really cool channels on the F Sharp org Slack, data science, um, general, beginners, jobs, all sorts of really cool stuff there. Um, the, 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 the challenge I had just as a kind of a segue for, for, for you, Cam, as well, when I wrote my book, it was just when .NET Core 1 was just coming out. So it was like, do I target .NET Core, even though it's not really a replacement for framework, or do I stick with the framework approach, which is what I took at the time? Obviously, now it's five years later, six years later, you know, .NET Core is the place to be. So um, all it, I can say is watch there, this Is there a new edition of your book in the works? Yeah, that's something I'm, I'm considering doing now. I've just started sort of talking about it. And um, yeah, that, that's probably where, where it would go. And the good thing is, like, the first half of the book is mostly the language. None of that has changed. But the second half was all about working on framework, using the libraries and tools, and all of that is, is, is different today. So that's awesome. really where the um, challenge is. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. Well, I want to, on behalf of our viewers and uh, other co-hosts, thank you for coming on here and, um, and sharing this walkthrough of your F sharp knowledge with us. Uh, I did, I think have a bit of an aha moment. I'm going to dive in and I'm going to totally lose it and, and I'm going to get more confused and I'm going to be bothering Luis and, and uh, we'll, we'll feel free to check in, uh, in in like a month or two and, and see if I've pulled out all my hair or how that's going. <laughs> um, so, uh, so thank you everyone for uh, watching uh, the .NET doc show. You can check out our show recordings, our upcoming topics, and more at the .NET docs .dev. Uh, please tune in next week when we will have, and help me, Luis, is it this Syme? Is it pronounced his last name? Syme? Don Syme? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Uh, we'll be having him next week for an F sharp Ask Me Anything. Um, our Ask Me Anything shows are uh, where they're kind of special. We enjoy doing them. They we take a different format and we get um, you know uh, if anybody came to the F sharp Ask Me Anything a few months ago, it was a like a big event. We had like uh, Bill Wagner and uh, uh, we had Mads and. Um, who else? Uh, John Skeet. Um, so we had a lot of fun. Our F Sharp Ask Me Anything, I think, also promises to be a lot of fun. So we hope to see you then. Uh, with that, wish everybody a happy week. So long. Take care. Bye. Bye.